If you would turn with me to Matthew 5, we're going to continue our march through the Beatitudes this morning, and we'll be picking up in verse 8 where we left off last time. You know, I never really know uh, what's going to happen in my week. Clearly, I'm not God. Um, but, you know, sometimes even I get surprised by conversations that I have, and, and I'll, I'll just have these odd little interactions with people, and they somehow find their way into sermons. And so I, I forewarned someone this week and said, I'll be talking about you at church, and they were thrilled. Um, so have you ever um, heard the following question? It's been asked in many a philosophy class, or maybe that one friend of yours that likes to argue about something or anything that they possibly can will ask you the following question. It goes a little something like this. If a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, does it make a sound? You ever been asked that question? So if a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, does it actually make a sound? To me, this has always been a stupid question, right? Now, and, I, and, I, and some people are like, whoa, philosophically. I'm like, no, your ear records vibrations and sound. It doesn't create them. Can we all agree on that? Your ear's just recording. So you're like, okay, yes, clearly the tree made a sound. You just weren't there to record it, okay? And so that's fine. And if you're like, actually, Mike, we could have a discussion about this. That's fine. As long as we're doing it over coffee and with our Bibles on the table, I'm good with it. Okay, so the, the short answer is yes. But I think there's a little bit more of if a tree falls in us than we'd like to admit. I think there's a little bit of that philosophy inside of us. And here's why I say this. I was driving down Northwest Boulevard this last week on my way to the office. It's like Tuesday or Wednesday. And as I'm cruising down the street, a motorcycle's coming towards me on the other side and gets into the turn lane, but there's nowhere to turn. And so immediately I'm like, this is a motorcycle cop, right? And so I check my speedometer like a good Christian does. <laughs> and so I check my speedometer and I'm fine. I want to go on record. I was fine. I was doing the speed limit. Well, the gal that works in my office in the shop that's in my office was not 10 minutes prior. And he was on his way back from giving her a shiny ticket. Um, to, oh, wow, we have a B in here. Someone want to get that? Do it, Isaac. Oh, it's above them, though. I don't know if you want to do that. I'm going to cut all this out of the message. It's fine. Just keep an eye on it. Just don't slap it onto anybody. Okay. All right, I trust you. All right, moving on. <laughs> all the people. My son, is he in here? Is Christian in here? Oh, okay. You're in, you're, he's the farthest away possible. <laughs> he would be anyway. Okay, so anyway, moving on. So she, she got pulled over by this cop, and, and she got a, a ticket, which stinks. And as she and I were talking that day, she was describing the incident to me, and she said this, and it, it, it just made me pause as I went back to my office. It's only speeding if you get caught. <laughs> Our police officer in the room's laughing. <laughs> it's only speeding if you get caught. If a tree falls, right? Think about this. Think about how that speaks to our philosophy of things. Scientific laws, physical realities, morality, do these things only matter if someone sees or hears? Do these things only matter if someone sees or hears them happen? Is that the only time that they're actually wrong? Is if we get caught? Is getting caught the qualifier for something being right or wrong? Now we say no, but many times we live, yes. Hence our struggle with sin and hence our private struggle with sin. Not only in the heart, but when we're alone. Long before social media marketing and algorithms, people in Jesus' culture fixated on their external image, what they look like on the outside. But their image wasn't about brands and possess possessions so much as it was about religious practices and symbols of piety, i.e., what people see. At a boy. <laughs> the sacrifice has been made. <laughs> so you guys, th they were struggling with the same types of things just in their day and age. In other words, that they were struggling with their image in relation to religious practices and sim symbols of piety, what people see on the outside. Jesus talked to the Pharisees about this often, didn't he? about what they were most concerned about was what people were seeing when they looked at them. 
And Jesus here in the Sermon on the Mount is dismissing the importance of the external to emphasize the internal. And he's not saying the outside doesn't matter. What he's saying is if the outside doesn't reflect what's on the inside, it's not genuine and it's hypocrisy. If we're only Christians who wear the right kind of clothes and say the right kind of words, but we aren't pure of heart, then we're just whitewashed tombs like the Pharisees were. In God's kingdom, outward piety without inward purity is the definition of hypocrisy. Outward piety or holiness without inward purity or inward holiness is the definition of hypocrisy. It doesn't matter if you're fooling every single person in the world right now. Many have. Many have, and we've been reading about them in the papers after their death, haven't we? They had everyone fooled that they were doing everything right. They stood on a false platform of piety, and what was going on behind closed doors sickens us and should because it's disgusting. And it's sinful and it needs to be repented of. And the pure in heart is what God is looking for. It's what he's longing to do in all of us. He's not longing to make us look good on the outside. Jesus aims to purify our hearts. And this is the reason Jesus taught here in Matthew 5 verse 8. As we look at our beatitude of the morning, you can look at it with me. Blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Not pure on the outside, the pure of heart. Now back in verse 3, as Jesus began the Beatitudes, we noted together that the poverty that Jesus was referring to, the type of poverty that he was referring to in the first Beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, was not physical poverty. Although those who are physically impoverished can still be blessed by God. They can still be blessed by God for sure. But what he's talking about in that first beatitude is not actually being poor physically, financially. What he's talking about is being impoverished in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, he said in verse 3. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are the poor in spirit. It's those who are poor in spirit that are blessed, recognizing that their need for God's redemption because he is holy and we are not is necessary. His focus is inward first. And he recognizes this. As we go from the first Beatitudes, the first four Beatitudes, which are very much our relationship to God, and we're now in this section as we were last week in these Beatitudes that are focused on our relationships Do you realize how much our relationships with one another are affected by our lack of mercifulness as we've talked about last week? Or us not being pure in heart, therefore not being pure in our interactions with one another. This all begins within. Notice that Jesus addresses purity in the same way. It's not superficial. It's not a cloak of piety that he calls us to wear. Rather, those who are truly happy or those who are blessed are those who are pure within in the heart. Martin Luther gave this passage some vivid detail as he described it this way. Christ wants to have the heart pure, though outwardly outwardly the person may be a drudge in the kitchen, black, sooty, grimy, doing all sorts of dirty work. In other words, he's calling this, this comparison to mind. He says, listen, he's not talking about you having clean jeans, He's not talking about you not having dirty hands in this world as you do your job. What he's talking about is that you are pure within, even in the midst of a very dirty world that gets on our feet as Jesus showed in John chapter 13. It's interesting. We don't think about that comparison in John 13 very often in reference to how filthy the disciples' feet would have been from walking around with sandals. Our feet are far cleaner in our society. It's a pretty dirty world to live in when you have sandals like that in a very dusty climate. Do you ever think about how filthy the disciples' feet were as Jesus washed them? And he taught Peter that important lesson for us to grasp. Peter, you're clean. In other words, you're saved, but your feet are dirty. You need to let me wash your feet. In other words, we live in a sinful world And it affects us, but Jesus cleanses us from those effects daily. It's an important thing for us to remember, and to remember that purity of heart does not necessarily get affected 
by the world that we walk through unless we surrender to it. Paul talks about us not being enslaved to sin anymore all throughout Romans. And yet how often do we find ourselves willingly giving our hearts over to something that's sinful, choosing that over the purity of God? David spoke of this as well in Psalm 24, verses 3 through 5. He says, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not appealed to what is false and who has not sworn deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. Purity of heart within, and don't mistake the clean hands for being good hygiene in that context. He's saying if you're pure of heart, what you do will follow. In other words, what you're doing with your hands will be clean as well. You see, because what we're doing in our physical lives is always reflecting a heart issue. It's always reflecting an inward reality. Oh, I just made a mistake. Really? Where do you think that began? It began in the heart. And that's where we have to deal with it. How often do we take physical measures to prevent ourselves from sin as if that's actually going to do the job? How many of us have been frustrated with physical things that we've taken, these physical actions to prevent ourselves from sinning? I'm just not going to go there anymore. I'm not, hey, I'm not saying that's necessarily wrong, but we thought that that action and that action alone would fix the problem, didn't we? We thought that that would cure us from it, but the problem doesn't, doesn't exist on just the outside. The outside is reflecting what's happening in the lack of purity within. We haven't gotten our hearts where they need to be. We haven't surrendered to God. We haven't given them to him for cleansing. And what I do with my hands and with my body is in cooperation with the purity within. Heart righteousness is nothing new to scripture. Heart righteousness is nothing new to scripture. It's all throughout the Old Testament. And neither is rule righteousness new to the flesh. Think about it. I'm going to keep the law. I'm going to do it this time. I've got this. I'm going to double down and I'm going to do exactly what it says. I can do this. I got this. I, 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 I. Do we possess the power to defeat sin? Only in Christ. Not alone and not apart from him. If we are not surrendering ourselves to him, we won't have victory over sin. Heart righteousness seeks cleansing within from the Spirit, begetting natural fruit production via the empowerment of the Spirit. Meaning that when I am being cleansed by the Holy Spirit from within, I will then produce good fruit. And how many people do we know are trying to produce fruit without the source? Just doing what they know is right or doing what they know they should do but there's not really a lot of fruit production there. Not a lot of fruit coming out of their lives to glorify God. And you're like, why? Why is this not happening? Maybe because there's a heart problem. You have a problem at the root, at the base. Rule righteousness seeks to present self as doing what God wants before others, even if it's just a show. Well, I'm going to keep these rules and then people will see that I'm a really godly person. I love God because of what I'm doing. Now, should we be able to see that? Should we be able to see it coming out of our lives that what we do actually does bring glory to God? Yeah, of course. Faith without works is dead. James is really clear about that. But what's happening within the heart is the engine behind that production. It's what's driving it. Our purity of heart is a product of applying the Beatitudes we've studied thus far, church. And if we look at this, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who are broken before God. Blessed are those who mourn, those who weep and grieve over their sin. Blessed are the humble because they get themselves low before God and say, you have the answers and I do not. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they're longing for more of God and less of them. They have the heart of John the Baptist. You must increase and I must decrease. And then it starts carrying outward. Blessed are the merciful. Because now when God has changed my heart, I I have compassion for people. I love them. I don't hate them even though they struggle with sin. I show them that their sin is destroying their lives in every possible way. I'm merciful and I have compassion to those people. And then blessed are the pure in heart. Purity within will beget purity without. 
if I'm pure before God, if I am letting him cleanse me of my sin, if I'm dealing with my stuff within, that's going to come out naturally. It's going to flow not only for my benefit and my cleansing, but it's going to affect every relationship I have. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't have relationships down yet. You can ask anyone from my wife to my acquaintances. Relationships are difficult. They take time. They take investment. They take prayer. They take brokenness. And if we are not broken before God in regards to our relationships with other people, then we are in sin. Because how often do we struggle in relationships because we have false piety? Because we think that we're doing it so much better than they are. Rather than humility before God saying, I need his grace just as much as you do. Begetting mercifulness and purity. The pure in heart will be the utterly sincere. J.B. Phillips said it that way. The pure in heart are the utterly sincere. In other words, there's nothing to hide. There's no deception. And that inward sincerity before God will not cease at transparency before him, but will create transparency before others. And our lives ought to be transparent to one another. If you're asking yourself at this point, boy, he's really not going to leave off until he's offended every person in this room. You're right. You're absolutely right. Because we are all sinners saved by grace, and every single one of us struggles with transparency. You want to know why? You all look pretty good this morning. And some of you are a complete wreck. Some of you are a complete wreck just like me. Some of you need to walk up to someone this morning. Maybe you don't need to come up here and proclaim it. But maybe some of you this morning need to go right up to somebody and say, I need you to pray for me. I'm really struggling with this sin and I need you to, I need you to encourage me. There is no shame in that. There's zero shame in that. Our lives ought to be transparent with one another. And that's difficult for all personality types. That's not just like, well, you're an extrovert, Mike. You talk about everything. (laughs) No, it just seems like I do. You're an introvert. introvert. You don't talk about anything. No, it just seems like you don't. This applies to all of us. And I'm not saying go back into your files and pull out those files and be like, May 22nd, 1974. (laughs) You know, like, Maybe you need to go back and and repent of that. But if you've repented, don't go unearthing sin. But maybe you're still in this place where you are in in, in lack of repentance right now. And you've just been wearing really nice church clothes. You've just been putting on a really nice cloak. We found some cloaks at First Baptist yesterday in the closets. So this, this was weird. Like there were choir robes, but then I found a black cloak in one of the closets, and the pastor of the church and I were laughing and daring each other to wear it today. But I told him, I said, no, I'll look like Fezzik and Princess Bride. Like, one of, one of my kids is going to run up and light that sucker, and then I'm going to be in trouble. But you guys, <laughs> maybe some of us have just been wearing the robes. And nothing's clean underneath. This is what I think the Lord wants to challenge us to this morning. How many of us are the same person no matter what the situation or location? Are you the same person? (laughs) There is not one person in this room that's not convicted right now. I'm sorry. You're like, I feel like I'm always the same. Ask the person closest to you. Just be really, really open and honest. Be ready for a little bit of, you know, a little bit of difficulty. But go up to someone and be like, do I act the same at church as I do at home? When I'm upset, is it the same as when I'm not? When I'm working on the car, is it the same as if I was watching a comedy? Doubtful. Very doubtful. We're all on very thin ice here. And the reason I'm pointing that out is because, as you can see, none of us are going to be left unchallenged with this because it, it's natural human tendency for us to put on masks, to mask up for the occasion, to look the part. And in the church, in the context of the church, so many times that, comes, that, that becomes comfortable because of the pastor. I prayed when we started this ministry. Oh, Sarah, forgive me. I prayed when we started this ministry 
that the Lord would enable me to be transparent. It sucks. It's the worst prayer ever and the best at the same time because so many people are seeing into my problems and I'm not making my sermons about my problems. I'm preaching my sermons from weakness because you need to see that it's Christ in me the same as it is you. It's his Holy Spirit transforming you the same as it is me and I'm not perfect and I'm making mistakes and I get really frustrated when guys try and race me on prairie. Especially when I'm in a 1.6 liter 86 Accor or Corolla. Come on. There's nothing in this engine that would make you think that I want any part of your Subaru. And that frustrates me. Like, Kids in this town going to move up to Athol. You guys. <laughs> Sorry, Isaac. <laughs> It wasn't you, I don't think. You guys, we're all, what are we doing? We, we can't pretend like we have this all together. We don't. We are a bunch of misfits, and that's the truth. But we are sinners saved by grace. Together. That's the beauty of it. I'm standing up here because I'm exercising my gifts, not because I have my stuff together. I'm using the gift that God's given me. And I'm fighting this battle just like you guys. How many of us act differently in private than we would in public? We switch personalities like it's a light in a room. We walk into a room and go, I'm in church now. Click. I'm in my bedroom. Click. I'm in Costco. Click. I'm in front of my computer. Click. I'm talking to my pastor. I'm talking to my spouse. This is reality. Purity of heart begets sincerity in all situations and in all locations. There is not one heart in this room that shouldn't be humble before God right now asking for cleansing, including mine. To be pure in heart means that we possess no guile or deceit. If you like the King James Version, remember what Jesus said to Nathaniel in John chapter 1, verse 47? He says, There... There's an Israelite in whom there is no guile. I put the CSB up there because it's more terms that we would use. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said about him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. By the way, if you want Jesus to say something about you, that ain't bad. Would he say that about me? That I'm not deceptive. You know what? I hope that he can right now. And by his grace, I want him to be able to say that every day from here on out. In the past, let's not, let's not dwell on the past. Jesus' mercies were fresh and new this morning. If we have repented to him and we are sincere in our walk with him, let's go forward in that sincerity. Stop holding on to the past. Stop living in the past. Stop dwelling on it. Stop going back to it. You realize that God's not the one in the morning when you think about something you did and you're like, oh, oh, I can't even get out of bed. He's not there going, yeah, that's right. You suck. That's not God. Scripture says his mercies are new every morning. And as we talked about last week, so ours should be too. And if I'm receiving that mercy fresh, then I am giving that mercy fresh. And that's why the merciful are, ble the merciful are blessed. Because they receive mercy from God and they give it right back out. It's syndrical. Think of how the nation of Israel was characterized by deceit. And think about how we want to be like Nathaniel. Think about how our world is characterized by deception. And we want to be like Nathaniel. There's no deceit in us. Not one bit. We want to stand apart like he did and so sincerely that Jesus is the one who declares us without deceit. He's not walking up to Jesus going, hi, I'm Nathaniel, I don't have any deceit. Right? No deceit in me. Guileless, that's me. No, 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 Jesus declares him that way. That's the right direction for it to go. I shouldn't have to tow tower tout the fact that I'm pure of heart. Hi, I'm Mike, pure of heart. Lowly too. 
right? Some people talk about Moses, you know, he was the most humble man. No man was meeker, right? It's like, wasn't Moses writing that? I'd like to think that Joshua put that part in there. Because that'd be really weird. Moses is like, that's me. <laughs> Signed, Mo. You guys, some, some weave a web. Think about this. When we think about deception, we're thinking about purity of heart. I'm just kind of going in the natural thought process of this. Some have lived in deception and weaved this web that's so thick, they actually start to believe the deception themselves. Have you ever started to buy your own lie? You wouldn't have bought it when you're trying to sell it originally, but you've said it so often and you've done it so often that you actually start believing it. Parents, we watch our kids do this sometimes. Kids, you can watch your parents do this sometimes. Let there be no deceit. Jesus is the only one who can free us from that entanglement. I knew a young gal in my youth ministry at one point who actually started believing her lies that she would tell, creating more and more of them to the point where she, she, when she wanted to walk her way out of it, needed the Lord to free her from this because she couldn't remember what truth was. I don't actually remember if I did that. I just said it so many times over that I, I think I might have. We can get ourselves into that place, and we need Jesus to free us from that. If our hearts are revealed here, and we're realizing that we're hearing ourselves described more than we like, I want to remind you of something because this can feel like you've got an anvil on your chest and it shouldn't. You want to know why? Pharisees caught a woman in adultery and they drug her into the middle of this space where Jesus was teaching. And they declared the law to Jesus and how it applied to her. And Jesus said, the one who's without sin can throw the first stone. He started drawing in the sand. Now, I get quoted this often from people who are saying we have no right to tell people that their sin is wrong because we're sinners as well. That's not the point of the text, and I'll show you why. Because if that's the point of the text that we can't call sin, sin anymore, then we're all doomed. The point of the text is what Jesus did after all those men standing around ready to condemn left, and it was just Jesus and this woman. John chapter 8, verses 10 through 11 says, When Jesus stood up, he said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? By the way, woman was a term of endearment. He's being gentle with her. No one, Lord, she answered. Church, hold on to this. Neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. Go, and from now on, do not sin any more. Did Jesus take the sin seriously? Enough so to say, don't do it anymore. But what did he give to her? Forgiveness. Jesus does not condemn us for our impurity. Jesus died to save you from your impurity. He died to save me from my impurity. He's filled us with his Holy Spirit, church, so that we might go and from now on not sin anymore. You see, the pure in heart not only recognize that he has cleansed us from sin, but that we are empowered by his spirit to go and not sin anymore. That story is beautiful because it defeats the justification of continuing in sin so that grace can abound, as Paul deals with in Romans chapter 6. When he says, should we sin more so that grace should abound more? He says, no, if God's called it wrong, don't live in that. The spirit has empowered us to walk in freedom, amen? Walk in freedom. Don't go back to that. You're free from that. Those who are empowered in this way will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. How are they going to see God? Because Christ has purified their hearts. Because Jesus has cleansed the heart and not just given us a better looking robe. He hasn't just given us church clothes. He cleansed the heart. He dealt with the problem. He got the root out. It's not because we finally got our act straight. We entrusted ourselves to the leading of the spirit and that change within insincerity begets change without. Church, our authenticity is essential. We must be authentic. 
in order to reflect Christ accurately, we must be authentic. And parents, can I encourage you guys? Don't try and put better church clothes on your kids. Don't try and dress your kids up to look like something they're not. Pray for their hearts to be changed by the transformative grace of God and lead them in the way that they should go by example. So many of us just want our kids to look nice. I understand that tendency. Sometimes I want my kids to just look the part. Sometimes I want people to look at them and be like, those Jacob's kids are perfect. How sinful of me to want people to not see transparency in them, to see that they are a work in progress as well, that they make mistakes, that their hearts get twisted, just like mine. I talked to my kids about this recently because I felt like this was something that didn't happen in my household as I grew up. I sat them down and I said, I want us always, because I don't know if you guys know this, my daughter Gina turns 18 next week. Yeah, so I'm popping pills. Um, I'm just kidding. I, you guys, I sat down with my kids and I said, listen, we need to respectfully disagree when you get older. We need to be able to respectfully disagree with each other. Because if you guys choose to make decisions that I don't agree with, I need to be able to speak to that and you know that I'm not going to cast you off. I need to be able to speak to what you're doing, but you know that I love you and that we're good. If it's sin, I'm going to call it sin. If it's something that I don't really see the point of, I'll probably say that, but I'm going to say that in a way, and we're going to work towards this together, that we respectfully disagree with each other. That's okay, because if we can respectfully disagree, we can love each other completely. We can love each other fully, and that's something that we need. Our authenticity with each other in our homes has to be essential. And I want to remind us too, church, that our hope is not in a better situation in this life. A lot of times we talk about authenticity. It's like, if I can get to this place, then everything will be as it should be. No, your hope is not in a better situation in this life. Our hope is in Jesus, which is outside of that. Our hope is in eternity in Christ. That's untouchable by people. Amen. No one can touch that. And so I recognize that the struggle will be real for all of my days. The struggle is real, bro. Yeah, and it always will be. It always will be. And that shouldn't dishearten us because Jesus said, I have overcome the world. In this world, you will know tribulation. But our hope is in Christ and the future he's secured for us in his own life. 1 John 3, verses 2 through 3. Dear friends, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We don't know what we will be then because we're not there yet, but we know this. We're his children right now. Can I get an amen for that? We are God's children right now. That is your family. I'm sorry that I'm not better looking. We are family. We're in this together, guys. We're going to worship him in glory together someday. And you better sing just as loud as I do. It's going to be a blast. We know that when, when he appears, John continues, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. When we recognize that the hope is in Jesus, the hope is in Christ, then we want to be like him. If he is the ultimate of what I desire to be, then I want every part of me to be like Jesus. And Jesus was completely pure. In thought and in action, in every possible way, he was pure. And our present efforts must be consistent with our future hope. The things that we're doing now have to be consistent with eternity, not just what we see around us. So many of us are settling to look like a better version of the world. Don't settle to look like a better version of this world. Our present effort is to be consistent with our future in Jesus. That's the standard. That's the call. That's the desire of the pure of heart. Our efforts within and without, in public and in private, in heart and in mind, in thought and in action alike. 
Worship team, you guys come on up here. As we consider these things, I tried to think through a couple ways to do this, and I, and I really didn't land with anything. So we're just going to see what the Lord does. But I don't know about you guys, but this, this hits me really heavy. This cuts me pretty deep. Thinking about being pure in my heart and thinking about what God has called me to and thinking about how often I'm just trying to look better on the outside. How I'm just trying to look the part of pastor or look the part of godly father or good husband or adequate husband. You know, whatever it is that I'm trying to look the part of, so many times I'm trying to do that on the outside. And I'm not addressing the issue that's inside in the heart. So here and now and together, let's address the heart. And I encourage you to do some serious time with the Lord later today in prayer. And to be really honest, to ask him to search your heart and to know you as David wrote in Psalm 139 to try you and know your thoughts. But I think that right here, beginning with our hearts submitted to him, I, I think we're going to do something that I don't do often. I want you guys to repeat this psalm after me just so it gets in our minds and our hearts. So I'm going to read a line. I want you guys to repeat it back. And this is right out of Psalm 51, and then we're going to go to our time of worship. But this is our prayer together. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? There's no need to read along. I'm just going to read it right out of the text. I want you to repeat. I'll read a line, and then you repeat it back. God, create a clean heart for me. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence. Or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me. And sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. And sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. Then I will teach the rebellious your ways. And sinners will return to you. God, maybe that's the reason. Why at times we have been so ineffective in reaching the lost. Because before we've gone to share your truth and your life with people, we have not asked for you to clean us first. To renew steadfastness within us. Lord, we've known that they need to hear the truth. We've known that the lost need to find you. Lord, that they need to see you that they need to understand their need. But Lord, so many times we're trying to even do that on our own strength. And so Lord, I pray that you would create a clean heart within us. That you would renew a steadfast spirit within us. That you wouldn't banish us from your presence. We thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness and that your Holy Spirit would powerfully indwell us. As we consider these things, Holy Spirit, flood this room. We know that you're here, God, but we want to be more aware of your presence. And at times, Lord, we see throughout your word that your spirit would fall powerfully on your people. And we ask that that would happen with us that we would be led by you, that we would be challenged by you, that we would be purified in our hearts by you because we long to see you. More than anything, we want to see your face. God, if, if that's not our, our most powerful desire, would you cleanse our hearts to see that it should be? Let's take a moment. Let's keep our heads bowed, our eyes closed. Just meditate on those words. <laughs>